Well, hello out there, YouTube, and welcome. Welcome back to this big summer series we're in, studying the questions that Jesus asked in Scripture. I'm hoping by now that you're really being impacted by this series, what I keep calling an exercise, because we're trying to personalize something really important. If you read the Gospels, you see all through them that Jesus asks a lot of questions. He asks a lot more questions than he actually answers, and I think that's a big deal for us to look at and really lean in on these questions. And it's, it's so fun to really do that as an exercise. And what we really always want you doing in Scripture is personalizing this stuff so that it can really mean something to you so you can apply it to your life. That's real, and that's what gets really fun. You know, we're calling this series The Simple Questions of Jesus because so many of the questions that he asks come out very casually. They do sound simple to just hear the question asked. But what's interesting is simple doesn't necessarily mean easy. Because while the questions might be clear, they might come out in casual conversations, they are very challenging to answer for ourselves. And that's really what this series is all about, answering these questions for ourselves. And I got to tell you something. What we're jumping into today begins a discussion on what I would say is one of the more important questions that we wrestle with in our time on this earth. This question from Jesus is such a big deal that the next couple of times that you see me here on YouTube, that the churches will see me on Sunday, I will be staying and just honing in on this question, working our way through just a few of the challenges that we face in this question as people. And I got to tell you something, I've been stuck on this one a lot lately. You know, I was working through some things with the podcast and some different concepts on stress and thinking about people and the challenges that we face. And I kept landing back in the question that we're about to jump into. And I believe it may be the most important question for each of us to answer personally in our own lives. While it might be the most important, I would also say, I think it can be the hardest one for us to see and process with in, in this world because the world is going to push against us even recognizing the challenge in this question or even seeing this question in any way. Here's the question of the day. It's found in many of the Gospels. We're going to hang out in Mark 8. This is verse 36 and 37. Jesus asked, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? All right, so let's talk for a little bit. I just want to talk about the culture and world that you and I are living in today. As we start to jump into this essential question from Jesus, we need to talk. Let's get honest about where this world is today. We live in a world full of people who are struggling right now, don't we? People who are struggling emotionally. They're struggling mentally. They're, they're struggling relationally. People who are walking through life or running through life, busy, stressed out, and completely exhausted, confused, and, and just unable to see clearly in a world that just continues to drive at a faster and faster and more painful pace than ever before. We're seeing people struggle to connect to each other and relate to each other more than ever before in a time when we seem to have more ways to stay connected than ever before. We're seeing people walk in major inner turmoil. We're seeing people struggle with loneliness and struggling tremendously in their inner worlds even if they try to project and can project that everything looks okay on the outside. We're seeing people falling into depression and anxiety. We're seeing mental health cases rising by the day. We're seeing people struggle to work through just the realities that they face in life. People struggling when adversity and challenges hit their life, struggling to work through that stuff, even though we know that is the reality of life. We're seeing people struggle to walk in personal relationships with others more and more. And we know part of God's design is that we humans do life with other people. People are really struggling right now in this world. Now here's what's interesting to me. It's interesting that as we seem to be struggling more and more in our inner worlds, we're also seeing a growing awareness of the issues of the inner world. We're seeing a growing awareness of mental health issues and, and, and we're talking more and more about self-care. It's like as a people we recognize and know that there's a problem. 
We know something isn't right and we're looking for ways to fix it. We have this growing openness and an awareness of mental health stuff, don't we? We're learning new terms for mental, emotional, and social issues. They're coming out by the day. I mean, just think back 10 or 15 years ago. Had you ever heard of a mental health day 15 years ago? We see commercials. You can't turn on your TV and not see commercials now for mental health and counseling. And and more and more people seem to be aware that their inner world needs to be worked on. And, and this is a good thing, are trying at some level to do some sort of self-care. They're trying to work on that area of their life. But here's what's interesting. While there's this growing heightened awareness of mental and emotional health issues and this inner world stuff, and while we acknowledge that we have a problem, we see it as a people and as a culture, that we need to be taking care of our inner worlds, it's getting worse. It's not getting better. We're living in the middle of a mental health crisis, and it's only growing. When I was putting the stress podcast together recently, I found this, this statement that just stuck with me throughout those podcasts that, that the fastest growing disease in the Western world is stress. There's this restlessness of the inner world that keeps growing. We're trying to find ways to calm it down, but it's only getting worse. So we are aware that there is an issue. We are more aware than ever before of how important our inner worlds are and that we need to care for them, but nothing we do seems to fix the problem. The turmoil, that restlessness, it just keeps growing. So we've got to ask the question, are we missing something? And the answer is yes. We are missing something. And what we're missing or ignoring is the fact that we are profoundly spiritual beings with a soul. This makes me think of a really powerful quote from St. Augustine. I've been stuck in this quote personally lately. It's come out a good bit in the podcast that I had on social media if you saw it. But um, St. Augustine says this. This is a big deal and something to really think through today. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That's huge, and we'll come back to that. We know there's a problem, but our problems go deeper than a practical fix or remedy. We are spiritual beings with a soul, and so many of our problems are profoundly spiritual. Listen, there is no irony in the fact that we are struggling internally more than ever before in a time when as a people in this world and our culture that we are choosing to distance ourselves from God more and more. We're pulling away from God and ignoring the fact that we are spiritual beings with a soul. It's not ironic that we struggle and become more restless as we distance ourselves from God. We must care for our souls. Our souls are the source of our lives. And and if we ignore them, they become the source of our pain. There's so many people out there in life that are just going through it these days. You know, we're struggling, we're, we're restless, we're hurting, and we can't seem to fix it. We keep trying, but nothing's working. And nothing will until we accept this truth that we are spiritual beings with a soul and we will stay restless until we rest in him. You know, this question that we're diving into today that Jesus is, is jumping into, I would say is describing the world that you and I live in today. We can gain the whole world. We can look fantastic to people of this world, but we can be losing our souls in the process. This is so important, yet so ignored as we just plow through life, trying to fit in, trying to be successful, trying to be productive, trying to navigate everything life on this planet throws at us. We can look great, but we're struggling because we are valuing the things of today in this world and devaluing the thing that matters most. That's why Jesus asks this question, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? It's a big question. It's a yes or no question. Is anything worth more than your soul? Well, the answer is no. 
But the challenge is we live in a world that wants you to answer that question with a yes. So that's what we're going to dive into together. The time that you're with me over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be hanging out right here in this concept and this question. It is a massive topic, and I want to spend some time with it on this topic with you. We're going to work through some of the major challenges that we face in life and, and, and struggle with as people. And what I've chosen to do is look at four ways that we can gain the world yet lose our soul. Now, it's not a complete list, and it's not... Um, necessarily all of them. There's a lot of different ways you can do this, so it's not a complete list, but I think it's four of the biggest and most challenging issues that we face. And we put this list up here in a second. You're going to see it, and you might think to yourself, like, come on, Sam. Like, I'm, I'm looking at that list. There's some of these things that I'm really not doing either, like, and I'm okay. I'm doing good. Like, well, I'd say this. You might look successful. You might look like you're doing well by the world's standards, but I promise you it's at a cost. So there's so much there for you. There's so much more for you in life when you understand that nothing is more important than your soul and you choose to care for and invest in it. So let's look at this list together. This is four ways that we may gain the world but lose our souls. So these first two, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to be talking about them in, both the, uh, in all the talks that we do, and I have to do that on purpose because they're just that important, and I hope that shows you how important they are. And then we're going to start jumping into this. So here's the four ways. First, number one, is disconnection from our Heavenly Father. Number two is pursuing our desires over God's desires. And then for the next two weeks, we're going to be hanging out in number three. Never rest, never stop, and never slow down. That's going to give us an opportunity to talk about three important principles inside of rest that I really want to jump into with you. And then when I come back, and this will be the combined service Labor Day weekend, when I come back, I want to talk to you about the fourth way we may gain the world and lose our souls, and that's people. I want to talk about isolation, and us versus them mindset, the pressure that we feel to fit in with people of this world, and the hurts and concepts of forgiveness and the ability to keep moving on and staying in it when it comes to relationships. And I can't wait to jump into this, but I'm going to just say on the front end, we cannot start this conversation about the importance of our souls without looking at these first two steps. We're going to do it in all three of these talks on it. And I want to go back to this. The first way that we may gain the world but lose our soul is by disconnection from our Heavenly Father, not connecting to God. So remember that quote that we read earlier from St. Augustine? I'd like to go back to that because I think it's such a big deal. He says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So we need to understand that we have been made by God for God. We are spiritual beings with a deep need wired into us by God to be with God. We need him in our lives. We are nothing without him. Yet so often... We don't choose to step into this most important connection and relationship. We don't engage him. We don't pray. We aren't jumping into scripture and trying to apply that to our lives. We don't worship him. We don't just center on him. We might do the church thing, but God's just not a priority in our daily lives and our souls are drying up. We're empty and we're restless and we might even be wondering in that state, why this Christianity thing doesn't work as well as it should or, or, or that it could. And as I read that, I just keep thinking about the importance of staying connected to God. Jesus says this in John 15, 4 and 5, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot, produce, you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Listen, nothing is more important than your soul. Your walk with God is the source of life for your soul. And without it, your soul dries up. You can look really successful. You can be really productive. You can be busy and look good on the outside. You can project the right things out there to people of this world and on social media. But you know and can feel the price that you're paying on the inside. See, if this is you and you aren't choosing to connect to your Heavenly Father, Jesus would ask you the question, what do you benefit 
If you gain the whole world but lose your own soul, is anything worth more than your soul? So the second way that we may gain the world but lose our soul is by pursuing our desires over God's desires. So this one's interesting and can hit us in different ways. But there's some things that we need to understand about ourselves. God has wired us with a deep desire for for fulfillment in our lives. We are spiritual beings with a soul. And something you need to know about the soul is the soul's pretty needy. The soul has cravings. The soul has these cravings and a desire for God. Here's the problem though. There's other cravings. The soul cravings that we have are not the only cravings that we human beings deal with. We also have human desires, fleshly cravings, and those two things, they are in conflict with one another. They're pulling us in opposite directions. Our soul Our souls crave and desire God. It's something wired deep inside us. It's this desire for God. It should be pulling us towards him. Psalm 84, 2, listen to this. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. See, the challenge is that as humans, we also have other cravings and other desires that conflict with those soul cravings for God. We often confuse or replace those soul cravings for God with other things. We could call it our appetites, our fleshly desires. We have this God-shaped hole inside us and we spend our lives knowing something needs to fill it. The problem is we just fill it with all the wrong stuff a lot of the times. We may not even realize we're doing this at times. Yes, we can be selfish. Yes, we can really try to live for ourselves. But I think oftentimes... We just have this inability to identify what we truly need. And we struggle to understand that there is a difference between our fleshly desires and our deep need for fulfillment that can only be found and come from God. See, this is why we pour into our relationship with God. Our fulfillment can only be found in Him. So I want you to see this scripture in Titus. In the message version, I find it fantastic. It describes the human condition so well. And I want you to look at this concept of being bullied around by our glands, by our desires of the flesh. And I want you to see this because it does describe the human condition well. Titus 3 verses 3 through 5 in the message version. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating back. But when God, our kind and loving Savior God, stepped in, He saved us from all of that. See, we need to see this. We have desires deep inside us for satisfaction and fulfillment. The soul craves God. God wired that in there so that we would be drawn to him. Yet so often we feel or know that something is missing in our lives. We just look in all the wrong places to fill that void. We look at what feels good or would fulfill our flesh rather than what our soul is truly craving. If we walk through life and we're starving our soul cravings while doing our best to find fulfillment in everything our human desires would want, we may find some fun along the way. We may look great to people, but Jesus would ask us the question, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? So now we get into where we're going to hang out over the next two Sundays. And we're going to focus on this third way that we may gain the whole world and lose our souls. That's going to allow us to talk about rest. So often we struggle because of the pace of our lives. And we ignore God's command and design for our lives. For this rest work rhythm that we should be in. We're going to dive into three really important topics in this concept of rest. The first thing I want to do is make a distinction between real rest and rest, the kind that's laid out for us in scripture. Jesus says there's a difference. The second thing we're going to do is jump into a study by Ruth Haley Barton, where she talks about the difference between good tired and dangerously tired. That's, That's a really big deal. There is a difference. There is tired inside of God's design, and then there's 
dangerously tired. And then next week, we're going to hit the last point, which will, all, all, will be all about our struggle to slow down and stop, to cease and be still. The challenge we face and slowing down and stopping from all the work and busyness and noise of our lives to be still and know that God is God. I'm looking forward to that as well. But this is something that we need to see. It's going to allow us to jump into a good theme on trust and how we live our lives next week, which will lead us into people. But I want to jump into this. There is, this is an important and major reason that we are struggling on the inside. We may be gaining the whole world, but we are losing our souls. And I want to start here. What is the difference between rest and real rest? It's interesting because according to Scripture, there is a difference between how we view rest as people and this real rest that can restore our souls. And so many of us know that we need rest. You don't have to be a Christian to know you need rest, right? We also know that God commanded us to rest. And we might think, I do rest. But we aren't experiencing the kind of rest that can restore our souls. We rest, but we don't feel rested. This is why it's so important to understand the difference between rest and real rest and where to find that. So you might be thinking, you know what, I spend a week at the beach. You know, I chill out watching um, Netflix and at night I disconnect from the world a little bit and just stream and binge watch shows. I, I have a hobby that I enjoy. I do things to rest. But what's interesting is that we do those things and never truly feel rested, right? Jesus talks about something important in Matthew 11. It's a scripture we bring up all the time. But in this, we see that there is a distinction between what we often view as rest and real rest for our souls. This is Matthew 11, 28, and uh, I'll just read 29. Are you tired, worn out, burn out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or fitting on you. This is a beautiful statement. And it ends with him saying, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. We live in a world today that has made it normal to be overworked, stressed out, and exhausted. Right? That's normal today. And it's made it weird or somehow wrong to slow down, rest, and be healthy. You think I'm making a strong statement there? Well, just listen to the conversations that you have with people. You know, go to church on Sunday and walk around the lobby. Just listen to what people have to say. Go to work and hear how people are talking around the corner. We're not competing over who's the most rested, the most centered on God, who, on God, who has the most margin and health in their lives, are we? We compete over who's doing the most, who's the most tired and the most overworked. Somehow it's become a badge of honor in our culture to be tired, worn out, and super busy. And it's causing a lot of damage. We wonder why we can't think straight or see straight. We, we wonder why we struggle internally. We wonder why stress is now being called the fastest growing disease in the Western world while we're living at a speed that we can't sustain. While we're living at this speed that we can't sustain and our souls are drying up as we exhaust ourselves with work, connectivity, and constant activity. Somehow this has become a good thing in our culture today. So even if we aren't tired and exhausted and unable to see straight, we need people to think we're tired and exhausted and unable to see straight. I want you to think about that. We, we place our hearts and minds and bodies in, in this constant state of fast forward. We know we're tired and we know we need rest. But we have to understand how to experience real rest. The kind that Jesus is welcoming us into. The kind that restores our souls. This is the first thing that we have to get as we talk about rest. There's a difference between rest and this real rest that Jesus speaks of. So how we define rest per personally is a very important thing. And I want you to think about that today. How do you define it? Process that. Personalize this. Like, what does it look like for you to rest? What is this real rest that Jesus talks about that, that can allow us to recover our lives and learn to live freely and lightly? 
So I got to tell you something. Sign me up for that, right? Don't we all want to live freely and lightly? Like that sounds like a lot of fun. We could would all say, I want that in my life. But more often than not, our answer to finding refreshment and restoring our soul is actually leading us away from what would actually get it done. It's leading us away from the real rest that Jesus is welcoming us into. For so many of us, when we think of rest, we're going to picture that week or two that we get off work. We take a week off work, we drive or fly to the beach or to some vacation. But let's be real. Have you ever come back from one of those bad boys like just replenished and refreshed and ready to go? No. You come back, all your work's still waiting for you. You work two weeks to have the week off to do the week and it all stacked up on you while you're gone. You come back tired and exhausted from that week and you jump right back into more work than you left from. You almost need a week to recover from that rest week, don't you? We come back more tired than when we left. Some of us, when we think about rest, we might point to a hobby or something that we enjoy doing or that's fun for us in our lives, but that doesn't seem to get it done either. Some of us point to binge watching our favorite shows on Netflix and other streaming services or or just disconnecting from reality for a little bit at night, but that doesn't seem to do it either, does it? Some of us medicate ourselves. We look for relaxation and Turn to things like alcohol or substances to take the edge off, to numb. But the reality is, even if we find a moment where we've turned down the noise a little bit, none of it eases up on us. The restlessness grows. And that moment doesn't lead us back to restoring our souls and refreshment. The rest of our lives are still there waiting for us. None of it is fitting into this concept of real rest that restores our souls. So think this through. What do you turn to for rest? And the follow-up question is this. Has that ever really allowed you to find real rest that refreshes and restores your soul? You see, Jesus is giving us the key to real rest here. The kind that can make a difference in our lives and our souls. So before we move on, you need to think this through. Do you find real rest to recover your life? If I asked you how your life was going, would you describe it as being lived freely and lightly? Are you experiencing the unforced rhythms of grace? Jesus explains that real rest is found in Him. It's not found in the next dream vacation. It's not found in a bottle or a substance. It's not found in your hobbies. It's not found in in, in a binge watching TV. It's not found in your phone and the endless hours of scrolling through Instagram reels. Like Jesus says, if you're tired you come to him you get away with him you watch how he does it and he'll show you how to take a real rest there is a difference between rest and real rest which can restore our souls and once we understand that we engage it rather than continuing to live exhausted lives completely dried up on the inside so there's one more thing i wanted to get into with you today and it's this concept of good tired versus dangerously tired It's a fantastic study and it's something I want you to see. We look at this concept of real rest which can help us discover our souls and I kept thinking about this. What's interesting to me is as Christians there's no way we haven't heard Matthew 11 28 through 30 before. Like we know the scripture. We're familiar with the words. Even if we're not Christians though we know that human as human beings we need rest in our lives. This is such an interesting thing. We know we need it to find and experience our best lives possible. We know it, but we continue to plow through life tired and exhausted. So in the podcast I was doing on stress, I did a thing on rest, and I found this study that I thought was fascinating. Um, I shared it with Ken. Him and I have talked about it a good bit and really wanted to make sure we shared this with you guys too. So Ruth Haley Barton came up with this study, and she talks about the difference between good tired and dangerously tired. And I want you to see the difference between these two things. So here it is. Good tired is when we put in a good day's work, we go home to relax and recover, and then return rested and ready for the new day. I'd call that the work-rest relationship that God designed. It's part of God's design that we work hard, that we work and then we go home, we rest, we come back replenished and ready for the next day's work. That's good tired. That, that's, that's part of it. We, don't, we, we do need moments where we work hard enough to be tired. But she also talks about dangerously tired. And dangerously tired is when we push too hard for too long. Dangerously tired is when we never seem to recover. 
Now, according to Ruth's study, we get the symptoms of dangerously tired, and I want you to see them, and we're going to try to linger in these a little bit, and I want you to try to personalize, see if any of this list would describe your life. So the symptoms of being dangerously tired include irritability, getting stuck in anger or sadness, and pursuing escapist behaviors like binge-watching shows or drinking too much. When you're dangerously tired, you lack the ability to rest even when you have space for rest. You become very negative, or a deep inner restlessness takes over your life. And you may not even be able to take care of basic human needs like showering or making appointments. And the fear that if you let yourself cry or scream or fight, you might not stop. I wonder if you read over those symptoms and you're like, oof, you know, I see some of me in there. You know, it's wild, but for some reason, we've made it a badge of honor to be empty and dangerously tired. But that is not what God desires for us. Not only was that not what God desired or designed for us, but think about that mindset that somehow it's normal or good to live a dangerously tired life, and it looks lazy or crazy for someone to be healthy, refreshed, and peaceful. So if you're reading this today, and you're living a hurried and rushed and dangerously tired life, you also know what the answer is. It's the, that real rest, the kind that can restore your soul. And you're not going to find that in a bottle. And you're not going to find that on social media. And you're not going to find that on Netflix. And it won't even be found in your next dream vacation. You know where real rest is found. You know where you need to spend your time. And you know with who, capital W, you should be spending it with. So the question then becomes, why aren't you doing it? We need to personalize this question today. Why aren't you willing or open to engage this real rest that can restore your soul? It's amazing that we walk through life exhausted and unwilling to come to God to find this real rest for our souls. We refuse to do what he asks while we're being sucked into this weird contest of seeing who can be the most dangerously tired. And we wonder why we struggle with our inner worlds today. Listen to God speaking here. This is Isaiah 30, verse 15. I love this in the New Living Translation. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. But you would have none of it. This is an interesting thing. And I want us to go back over these symptoms of dangerously tired. And I want you to look at that list. I'm not going to read it again, but I want you to think through that. Do you read through that list of being dangerously tired and see some of you in that list? Does it describe you? You know, it's amazing to me that somehow it's become right to see this in your life, in the culture that we live in today. But we need to understand that is not a badge of honor for us to be empty and dangerously tired. That is not what God desires for us. So personalize this today. If you are dangerously tired, like deep down on the inside, you know what you need. It's that real rest that Jesus says we will only find when we come to him. So the question is not if we know what we need or if we know we need real rest, we know we need it. The real question is, are you willing to do it? So are you? If you are, that's awesome. But if you're not, The follow-up question is very important too. What's that? Like, why aren't you willing to stop and slow down and engage this real rest? If you feel weak and dangerously tired, your strength will come in settling down in complete dependence on God. It's found in quieting all the noise and coming to Him. So if you're feeling burnout and empty and dangerously tired, it's time to realize that the only way through life is in a deep connection to your Heavenly Father. It's not a badge of honor to be stressed out and exhausted. Those are not positive things in your life. They're actually signs that you, a child of God, loved by God, are living outside of God's design for your life. My encouragement for you today would be to make some new choices, to listen to God's Word and find time each day to unplug from this world and engage Him. And one of those podcasts on stress, I found this quote. I loved it. I thought it was so clever. 
It's so good. It's from Anne Lamott. She says this, Almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. And I love that quote, and it's so true, but I would definitely add something to it. It's more than just unplugging and then plugging back again into life. We are spiritual beings with a soul. We are created by God to be with God. So taking a week off of work is great. Shutting off the phone for an hour or two each day, awesome decision. But we must not only unplug from this world, but we must then plug into our relationship with God. That is when we'll find real rest for our souls. It's in that personal connection to Him. That's when we lose that restlessness that we're fighting, that we can never seem to calm down in our inner world. See, there's a reason that we are struggling in this world today. There is a reason that we walk through life tired and worn out, burn out on religion. There's a reason the world around us has made it normal or good to be exhausted, dangerously tired, overworked, stressed out, and has made it weird or crazy or lazy for us to be healthy and rested people. There's a reason that we see people searching for solutions to this deep inner restlessness that we all face, turning to vacations and escapisms and material possessions and science and research, and none of it's working. And none of it will, as long as we ignore the soul. We need to find this real rest that Jesus is welcoming us into. So if you're dangerously tired in here today, it's time to remember that we are spiritual beings with a soul created by God to be with God. And until we come to him, we will continue to struggle. We can look really good to people on this planet. We can get a lot done and be super productive. We can seem successful and very popular to people of this world while at the same time struggling. And Jesus would ask the question, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Listen, we love you so much, and I'm really excited to jump into this, but please wrestle with this question. Wrestle with the concepts of real rest for our souls versus rest, and good tired versus dangerously tired. And next week, I'll be back to talk to you about the most challenging thing to do that has to happen if we're going to engage this real rest, and that's to stop working, to stop moving, and to engage this real rest, which is the key to us experiencing our best lives. We love you so much, and we'll see you again next week.